First, we'd like to welcome our RSA audience who may be joining us for tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is Justin Hudson. I am the one of the co-coordinators along with Scott Barnett. Um, tonight's keynote will be by uh, Colin Brook, uh, Colin Gifford Brook, to be technical, right? Um, so we're looking forward to his talk. And I want to introduce uh, one of our rhetoric graduate students, uh, Martin Law, who's going to uh, introduce Colin. Okay, so the closing keynote for the for the 2015 Indiana Digital Rhetoric Symposium will be presented by Colin Brook. Professor Brook is associate professor of writing, or excuse me, rhetoric and writing in the writing program at Syracuse University. He also served for three years as the online associate editor for college composition and communication. And he is currently the director of electronic resources for the Rhetoric Society of America. In his 2009 book, Lingua Fracta, Toward a Rhetoric of New Media, um, uh, th th this book won the Computers and Composition Outstanding Book Award in 2010. Uh, so in Lingua Fracta, uh, Professor Brook argued that the canons of classical rhetoric could and indeed ought to be recomposed, not as static categories, but as repertoires of practices, and, and that those repertoires must be responsive to their moment, or they risk falling into obsolescence. In fact, throughout his career, Professor Brook has been invested in remediating, hacking, circuit bending, we could say, uh, rhetorical theory, particularly at its points of interface with new media, and using classical theory to help us address contemporary sites of analysis. For example, virality, which, uh, as I understand it, will be the focus of the, of the project you'll be discussing in this keynote this afternoon, which is entitled Cognition in the Wildfire, Digital Rhetoric and Peak Virality. So much of this weekend symposium has been inflected, I think, by a move to define digital rhetoric as a field, uh, as a theory or methodology, as a sensibility or as an object of study. Not because digital rhetoric is, is a new thing, because obviously the term goes back at least a few decades, uh, you know, Richard Lanham, uh, although uh, if, if we, if we um, like Elizabeth Losh in her opening keynote, suspect that the term must precede or exceed Lanham's singular authorship, we can perhaps take a moment from uh, maybe Byron Hawke's talk yesterday to note that the constitution of a community, be that a community of noise musicians or digital rhetoricians, is not contingent upon being able to locate a singular verifiable point of, point of origin. Instead, uh, and, and this again speaks to maybe Professor Lash's invocation of the everyday, but also, which is a topic that actually came up with a lot of the talks over this weekend, it might be that uh, digital rhetoricians are simply those of us who share certain uh, ecologies of practice, which brings us back, I think, to uh, Professor Brook, who in Lingua Fracta argued that we could reimagine the classical canons of rhetoric as ecologies. Practice, or, or paraphrasing uh, Lingua Fracta pretty liberally, uh, rather than viewing the canons as stable categories, instead we can, uh, we can take them as relations, activities, repertories of practice, uh, but without ever being reducible to those relations, activities, or practices. And in this way, I think Professor Brooks' uh, work gives, might give one, or at least gives me, a sense of how to proceed in the days and weeks following the symposium as we think about and interact with all the fantastic work we've experienced uh, here uh, together. Um, as a graduate student, of course, my first impulse is to do something like attempt to assemble an archive of new readings to do and put together a, a, a literature review of digital rhetoric, uh, which, of course, is an acceptable thing to do. It's a practice I've been trained in and uh, is, in fact, one that would be very helpful for someone, for example, trying to write a seminar paper or a comprehensive exam question. But to reconceive for a moment of the rhetorician, not as one who can drop a strategic G-bomb, that is to say, Gorgias, uh, into a conversation but as one who's attuned to, who lives within and who studies ecologies of practice. In this way, we might gain a more productive sense of definition within the field, that what might make one a digital rhetorician, or at least this is what I, I'm going to attempt to take away, is, is one who t pays attention to uh, and composes within, uh, or, or composes with, I'm sorry, digital practice ecologically understood. So before I turn this over to Professor Brook, I want to take a moment to greet our streaming viewers. Uh, this keynote is, of course, the Rhetoric Society of America's 2015 graduate webinar. If you're viewing this on the web, uh, welcome. Please feel free to ask uh, to ask uh, questions by submitting or submit questions for Professor Brook via Twitter uh, during his talk. 
uh, you'll do so uh, using the hashtag IDRS15, IDRS15. And at the end of the talk, I will relay those questions to Professor Brook. Uh, so uh, let's get started. I'd like uh, to invite you all to join me in welcoming uh, Professor Colin Brook. Microphone working? Can you hear me? No. No. Is it, on? it is on. Well, hello. Um, how about now? Okay. Fix me. Check, check. Check, check. How's this? Better? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to thank Martin for that introduction. And, um, of course, thank um, Scott and Justin, and honestly, everybody here at Indiana for putting on a, a lovely event. And I want to also thank um, everyone who's presented before me over the last couple of days. Um, I think what you'll hear tonight are a number of echoes in my talk, sort of resonating with everyone else's presentations. Um, I think there's a lot of overlap. Well, I, we've already seen, I think, a bunch of overlap. Um, it's flattering to be asked to deliver the closing keynote at this event, uh, but it also sort of meant extra pressure for me over the last couple of weeks. I feel the weight of being asked to provide the final word on this sort of series of conversations and presentations. Um, rather than talk directly about sort of the research that I'm doing, I wanted to try and push myself to think about kind of the future of digital rhetoric, to think it in the, the future tense. Um, and so I'm going to be probably a little bit more scripty than I normally am in my presentations um, and more reliant on sort of text on my slides. So a little bit of apology, but honestly, I think I'm trying to sort of push my stuff forward a little bit. So um, my goal is to think about sort of the immediate challenges that face digital rhetoric in the next, say, three to five years. Easy task, right? Um, let's go. Uh, turn on. This talk is going to tackle, a, I think, a fairly small piece of that task. I take a cue tonight from artist Julian Oliver. In an interview a couple of years ago, Oliver described the importance of his work by explaining that infrastructure must not be a ghost, nor should we have only mythic imagination at our disposal in attempts to describe it. Oliver's example is the cloud, which he calls a dangerous simplification akin to a children's book. And we could probably list others, cookies, spam. Um, we used to think of the internet as an information superhighway. His point is not that we shouldn't draw on metaphors to make the digital more accessible, but that at a certain point, those metaphors can interfere with our critical faculties. The simplification that I want to address tonight is the idea of virality. Um, UC Perica writes that the virus has imposed itself as a powerful trope but its logic is not reducible to one of a metaphoric play of language. I'm gonna take this one step further and argue that what we call going viral is not only more than a simple metaphor of language or communication as a virus, but paradoxically, it's also less than a complete metaphor for those phenomena. Perhaps needless to say, I believe that virality qualifies as the kind of dangerous simplification that Oliver argues against. So what I'm gonna to do tonight is start with a representative anecdote, a story that was published on Medium last week, appropriately titled Going Viral. While virality refers most directly to the ways that information spreads, I wanna suggest that it's picked up some other associations along the way. I'm gonna turn briefly to some of the history behind virality, in part because the idea predates our current usage, and in part because that history influences it. I'll return to the present day and talk a bit about how I see virality playing out as a cultural logic or a media logic both in terms of its features and its limits. And then I'll close by considering the role that digital rhetorics might play in helping us to understand and engage with the viral. Um, I feel like I should warn you, um, each of these topics could be its own talk. And so I'm gonna be sort of skipping through it. Um, there are several excellent books on this topic already. Um, Perica's Digital Contagions, Petta Mitchell's Contagious Metaphor, um, Nahan and Hemsley's Going Viral, Tony Sampson's Virality, 
Um, so this isn't exactly uncharted territory, but I think it's an important site for us to think about with respect to digital rhetorics. So here we go. Uh, I subscribed to the Daily Digest from medium.com. And as I was thinking about my presentation a couple weeks ago, I saw this story, um, a story called Going Viral, written by Eric Smith. It was a story about the photograph that I have here on the screen, um, which Smith himself took in January. Going Viral is an essay in an emerging genre, which I think of as bemused virality narratives. I took this photo and what happened next will blow your mind. Um, in this case, Smith tagged his local TV station on Instagram who aired the photo and it was quickly picked up by the Huffington Post, CBS News, Good Morning America and the Today Show. As the tagline for Smith's essay proclaims, his photo has been seen by millions of eyeballs. In titling his photo a sign of the times, Smith hints at the broader genre that his photo participates in, one characterized by the vertical logic of the image macro. You can almost hear the SMH hashtag when Smith explains that the man in the photo represents many of us who use smartphones. The message is simple. It is amazing to have the world at your fingertips, but let's not miss the extraordinary world right in front of us. Hashtag SMH. Um, the meme almost writes itself. Smith is conscious of the irony here, that his unintentional commentary on technology spread like wildfire through technology. But there's more to it than that. Smith is a professional photographer. His own purpose in being there wasn't exactly unmediated access to the extraordinary world right in front of him. Not only, or nor do we know why the human subject of the photo was so engrossed in his phone. Um, he remains anonymous, even though his, like, his likeness has now been attached to this image for millions of people millions of eyeballs. I'm actually more interested tonight in the aftermath of the photo and its virality. If you visit Smith's professional website and look at his bio, it has been recently updated to reflect the events he describes. The first paragraph now explains that Smith created a photographic image in early 2015 that began a worldwide dialogue about our dependency on technology. The photo of a whale surfacing while a man checked his phone went viral after being picked up by hundreds of media outlets around the world in three days. The image has now been shared by millions of people. What intrigues me about this is the sense of achievement that accompanies this account. And that's part of what I wanna talk about tonight. Strictly speaking, virality refers to the breadth and speed with which something circulates, but there's an axiology to going viral as well. That's it. By axiology, I mean the argument, and it's not a new one, that treats popularity and quality as reversible. If people are motivated by the quality of an essay, song, or video to share it, then the fact that it has been shared widely becomes a symptom or even confirmation of its quality. More than ever before, the idea of going viral, of exceeding one's initial audience, is a marker of rhetorical success, at least for those who produce the content. Um, for those who become the object or even the target of virality, the consequences are a little more mixed, to put it mildly. According to the self-described viral content specialists at BreakthroughContent.com, viral content goes viral in the first place because it is, by definition, incredibly compelling. The material is so good, so unique and worthy, in other words, that people actually feel compelled to recommend it across social sites like Twitter and Facebook. It's one thing, I think, to see this equivocation on a marketing website. Its authors have a clear financial stake in both the idea of viral content and in claiming that they have the skills to provide it. But the logic itself is infectious. Kareen Ahan and Jeff Hemsley's book, Going Viral, provides a really ex accessible account of virality, a great introduction to its features and its limits. But in one spot, they write that virality can signal what is considered important and interesting to parts of a society at a particular time. And traces of viral content may also become a way of documenting the fabric of societies. As such, future generations may find the viral events of today valuable lenses into our time, providing insights that we ourselves will miss because of our own embeddedness in the world from which these very events arise. I was gonna try and Photoshop uh, a picture of Cleo, the Greek muse of history, into each of those dresses, but I ran out of time, so use your imagination. Um, Neon and Hemsley are pretty careful here, suggesting that virality may offer us a perspective on history and culture 
that the limit that our limits may not otherwise provide. And this claim isn't so different from the case made on behalf of distant reading, topic modeling, and digital humanities in general. And yet, it's not hard to imagine a slippery slope, too, where history becomes something like YouTube's annual five-minute year and we rewind videos. We're already seeing this tension play out in journalism. When someone can claim, as Ben Thompson did last month, that BuzzFeed is the most important news organization in the world. Before I talk about some of the issues that this raises, though, I want to dip briefly into the history of virality. And it starts with this fella. Most discussions of the idea of language as a virus trace back to William S. Burroughs. Part of the reason why I use the word idea rather than metaphor is because for Burroughs, it wasn't metaphorical. And it's not a particularly positive notion either. For Burroughs, we are contaminated by language. Burroughs' answer to this isn't to embrace or to replicate that symbiosis he describes, but to disrupt it through techniques like the cut-up to force the virus itself to mutate. We see glimpses of, Bur of Burroughs in post-structural theory, Deleuze and Guattari liken rhizomes to viruses and a thousand plateaus. Derrida describes his project at one point in a 1989 interview as a kind of virology. In fact, he goes so far as to define rhetoric itself as a parasitic or viral structure in, in its origins and in general. So on the one hand, we have viruses as these disruptive, dangerous forces. But virality has at least one other important ancestor. Richard Dawkins wasn't the first thinker to apply Darwinian or neo-Darwinian theories of evolution to culture. But we could make the argument that, by coining the term meme, he has had the broadest impact. At the end of his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, Dawkins engages in a thought experiment speculating that we might study memes as cultural units in the same way that he would have us think about genes for biology. As Dawkins himself reports in an update to the book, the idea of memes proved itself to be a very effective replicator. In the mid-1990s, a spate of books came out proclaiming a new science of memes called memetics. If I get through this entire talk and pronounce memetics correctly every single time, it will be a miracle. Memetics reverses the traditional humanist model of communication, imagining instead that we are hosts for a vast and complex meme pool of ideas that uses us, that uses humans, as means of replication. The pithiest example of this reversal is da Daniel Dennett's line that scholars are a library's means of making other libraries. In a weird sense, kind of like Garfield minus Garfield, memetics is an attempt to study culture and communication without any of the messiness of the humanities or the social sciences, or humans for that matter. Um, reading these books now is an interesting experience. They come across as a mix of marketing and self-help with a dash of popular science. While each of them attempts its own take on the so-called field of memetics, they have in common the desire to turn rhetoric into a science. Another feature they have in common is the fact that they all build on Dawkins, who identifies the meme as the basic unit of culture, but he doesn't do much else with it. He doesn't really consider how these memes might actually function, except to note that it probably includes some kind of imitation. And so in the interest of extending his metaphor further, memetics turns to the metaphor of viral transmission. As it considers thought contagion or viruses of the mind, though, memetics doesn't adopt the metaphor wholesale. There's little acknowledgement that vi viruses might be disruptive, dangerous, or harmful. In one small moment of introspection, Richard Brody admits that the outer reaches of this line of thought are dark and scary. But he suggests that for our best interests and the best interests of our children and our children's children, we owe it to ourselves to do whatever we can to understand it. One of the critiques of memetics that surfaces has to do with their unwillingness to think of its deep implications. It offers a model of communication focused solely on what makes ideas spread effectively without pausing to ask whether those ideas should spread. It sets aside questions of ethics, aesthetics, politics, and culture itself. In its focus on virality, memetics overlooks the virulent dimension of viruses, the consequences, positive or negative, that an idea might have for the people who subscribe to it. Ultimately, though, memetics did not prove to be as robust a meme complex as its proponents had hoped. Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point appears shortly thereafter in the year 2000. And while that book shared certain assumptions with memetics, it's less a replication than a mutation of those ideas. Gladwell's work shares much more with the network studies scholarship that follows it than it does with the memetics that came before. So memetics lasts a few years longer, 
But by 2013, even Dawkins himself is a little bit dubious. When asked in an interview with Wired UK how he felt about the word meme being reappropriated, Dawkins tries to argue that, of course, that's what, he's, that's what he meant all along. And this is, I find this kind of funny. Um, the meaning is not that far away from the original, he insists. It's anything that goes viral. In the original introduction to the word meme in the last chapter of The Selfish Gene, I did actually use the metaphor of a virus. So when anybody talks about something going viral on the internet, that is exactly what a meme is. And it looks as though the word has been appropriated for a subset of that. Um, unfortunately, the word no longer means what Richard Dawkins thinks it means. Um, but memetics had bigger problems than staying true to Dawkins' terminology. There are obvious questions about whether they could or should reduce culture to the decontextualized flow of information. Honestly, though, one of the biggest issues that memetics faced was that it wanted to make macroscopic claims about culture and communication without any way to actually put those claims to the test. Memetics has mutated into a variety of fields now. Network studies, media ecology, cultural analytics, and the like. And those fields have reaped the benefits of more sophisticated methods and abundant materials, uh, many of which were sort of gathering under the, field, under the umbrella of digital humanities. But I would argue that there are still some vestiges of the, mem of the mem 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 memetic approach. See, I, I know I would get it. That's the same spot in my walkthrough that I would always get caught in. Some vestiges of the memetic approach. There are still some of them. And we can see them in accounts like Smith's. Um, I don't mean to harp on him tonight, but because really his story is one of many of these kinds of accounts. But according to his logic, or according to the logic that his story operates by, cultural objects themselves go viral. And virality is seen as something that races beyond the control of any individual or any institution. In this, in this sense, virality carries with it an almost naturalized sense of inevitability. At the same time, though, virality is recognized as a desirable outcome, something to be achieved, a measure of rhetorical success. It's kind of like someone who buys a lottery ticket and then convinces themselves after they've won that it was meant to be, or that they deserve to win. Um, perhaps the truth lies somewhere in between, a combination of luck and strategy. We could certainly make this argument in the case of Smith's photograph. He knew ahead of time that he would need to bring his camera equipment. Um, he sailed out there. He had decades of experience and practice that went into the photo itself. Um, he knew enough to tag the photo and notify the local TV station. He knew that they had been showing pictures that were similar. Finally, that local affiliate was part of a national network of stations, um, at the hub of which were things like the morning shows and the nightly news programs. This is a graph from Nahum and Hemsley's book, which suggests a, a general pattern according to which virality happens. The horizontal axis shows the time that content is available, and then the y-axis sort of optimistically measures the percentage of the population that has seen or shared it. If we made the y-axis um, new users, what would happen is kind of this um, a spike and then a drop. If you've ever gone to the site Know Your Meme and looked at like the Google search results for those particular terms, it starts out at zero and then it spikes and then does that. Um, this is a slightly different graph from that. Um, we might say that there's a combination of skill, craft, and or talent involved in moving content to the point where critical mass occurs and it takes off, where it literally goes viral. But we tend to treat the tail of this graph, as Smith does, as an uncontrollable phenomenon, a phenomenon that's characteristic of rhetoric on the internet. I took this photo and what happened next will blow your mind. And yet, it's worth asking how much of a break from the past a curve like this represents. We might just as easily use it to chart the diffusion of a popular television show where the project goes through production, casting, it's broadcast, it gets reviewed, it goes into syndication, um, et cetera, and shows up on Hulu. Um, or a novel that sells well, breaks through on the New York Times bestseller list, gets released in paperback, gets chosen for Opus Book Club. Um, that sort of slow, fast, slow pattern isn't entirely different from what happened in sort of older, more traditional media. Viral content experts will tell you that the big difference here is that traditional media have been massively democratized or decentralized by the internet. If you remember the quote from our friends at breakthroughcontent.com, 
content goes viral because people are compelled by its quality to share it amongst themselves. In other words, they argue, viral content isn't dictated to us by network executives, publishers, or studio producers. The problem with this vision of viral content untouched by traditional media forces is that it's not strictly true. This is a network map of the Twitter activity surrounding the Harlem Shake from a couple years ago. Um, and one of the things it illustrates is how much of that traffic is generated by actually by a, a very small handful of nodes. Um, as Kevin Ashton explains in his sort of post-mortem of, uh, of the event, the original video was cross-promoted with within a set of high traffic accounts to send views to YouTube. Then Maker Studio, a, an advertising subsidiary of Time Warner, made its own video and promoted it in particular to other ad agencies who were looking for something new. This was the week after the Super Bowl that it happened. These two clusters of activity were enough to get the phenomenon to Reddit, where it was picked up by IAC, which is the parent company of College Humor, Newsweek, Vimeo, um, and others. And then later BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, and other websites. In other words, while social media has indeed redrawn some of the traditional boundaries and paths within the culture industry, part of what Ashton's account reveals is that it hasn't erased them. Things still go to the hubs, which distribute them widely. That some of the rules have changed doesn't mean that there are no longer rules. The network diffusion map of the Harlem Shake is a complicated instantiation of a fairly simple idea, the scale-free network. And this is one of the places where network studies sort of parts ways from memetics. Scale-free networks are characterized not by decentralization or a free marketplace of ideas, but by extreme asymmetry between hubs and spokes. There is some role played by the ideas themselves. If there weren't, then everything would presumably go viral. And yet, the topology of a scale-free network lends itself specifically to virality. Tony Sampson describes the hubs within such a network as aristocratic, and it's hard to disagree with that label. Scale-free networks encourage what sociologist Robert Merton called the, the Matthew effect, the idea that the rich get richer in terms of links, attention, traffic, and exposure. So yes, in certain ways, uh, Nicki Minaj's 19 million Twitter followers are different from those 50 million Elvis fans, but in some ways they're not. In addition to the providers and the content and the network, there's at least one additional factor here to consider, and that's the platforms themselves. Um, this is one of the things that even the most detailed network maps struggle to articulate. The different affordances, constraints, incentives, behaviors, and ultimately data that social media platforms generate. Each of these platforms, whether they conceive of themselves as content providers or conduits, benefits in terms of economic and cultural capital from the patterns that we associate with going viral. Um, all of these charts and items here are from an article in a recent, view, a recent issue of Model View Culture by Yoon Sung Kim. She it looks at trending hashtags on Twitter in the context of Ferguson. The Ferguson story and its hashtag trended quickly on Twitter and made Twitter actually kind of the platform of choice for information and updates about Ferguson. And yet, despite the con continuing high volume activity surrounding the hashtag, it eventually disappears from Twitter's sort of top 10 list. Um, there's a lot of information on this slide. And she, what Kim does is to track several hashtags over the course of about a month. And I've put three of those charts on there. The problem with those charts is that they all have different y-axes. And so they look like they're directly comparable. Um, the Ferguson one is on the bottom. And comparing that to We Want the Cup, which is the second one, the um, the We Want the Cup hashtag peaked at about 750, and the low point for Ferguson was about 2,000. So Ferguson was a, maybe about three times as active as the other one. But if you look at the chart in the upper right-hand corner, We Want the Cup actually appears on the top 10 list for that day, and Ferguson is nowhere to be found. Um, so Ferguson kind of vanishes from Twitter's top 10 list. Kim explains that for Twitter, something cannot trend for too long because this isn't their definition of what's now and new. Um, this is why Ferguson failed to trend after a few days, even though it was one of the most widely used hashtags. I mean, over the course of a month, it was outperforming other stuff that appeared in those top 10 lists. Um, trending for a few days excluded it from the possibility of trending. It's not that people weren't still talking a lot about Ferguson, it's that for, for Twitter, 
the story was too old to appear above the metaphorical fold. Um, we should find this a little scary, in my opinion. We tend to make fun of the excesses of the 24-hour news cycle and the ways that it leads to coverage of non-stories or meaningless updates. We bemoan our shrinking attention spans and our inability to engage in complex political and public conversations. For, for me, though, neither of those things is as chilling as the situation that Kim describes, where important events are effectively given expiration dates, after which they begin to disappear from our view because of the algorithms behind these sites. We might also ask what happens when this particular logic begins to shape the way that we frame discourse. Um, earlier this week, the Columbia Journalism School released a report about Rolling Stone's coverage last fall of rape on college campuses. Elizabeth Stoker Brooding, writing for The New Republic, argues that one of the story's primary flaws was that it attempted to make a left-wing argument about systemic problems using right-wing tactics by focusing on a single individual case. Um, I don't think Brunig quite gets it right or goes far enough here. I would argue that Rolling Stone got caught trying to frame their story in a way that would make it so good, so unique and worthy, that people would feel compelled to recommend it across social sites like Twitter and Facebook. To borrow once more that definition from BreakthroughContent.com. If you read the Columbia report and the interviews with the journalists, what becomes clear is that they actively pursued a certain type of story, one that would go viral at the expense of what they allegedly wanted to accomplish with the story. As a result, the Rolling Stone debacle has had the opposite effect. It ended up hurting the very people it was meant to help and probably move their cause backwards. It would be easy enough to conclude today by reminding you of Julian, Ro Julian Oliver's dangerous simplifications. I could tell you that one of the challenges facing digital rhetoric is its ability to understand the causes and the consequences of virality. I do believe that that's the case. But I also want to suggest, as Zainab Tefechi does, that we need to update our nightmares. Perhaps the most, sim the most simultaneously hilarious and horrifying moment of last week's episode of uh, Last Week Tonight with John Oliver was when he showed a clip of Andrea Mitchell doing an interview about the NSA. A story raising important questions about surveillance and privacy was literally interrupted for live coverage of Justin Bieber's Bond hearing. According to the cultural logic of virality, this makes perfect sense. Only one of those stories was likely to trend on Twitter. Only one of them was likely to be turned into a meme and shared and remixed and going viral. Nahan and Hemsley argue that virality at its core challenges the main structures of institutions embedded in our lives, which consequently drives them to be more accountable, transparent, and participatory. And yet none of those, none of those values exist in a vacuum. It's worth asking, for example, to whom Twitter is being accountable when they disqualify ongoing stories from their trending topics, or what happens when participating in the distribution of viral content damages people's lives. The network cultural logic of going viral can indeed be a way of disrupting, in a positive sense, institutions that have become complacent or even corrupt. But I think that we're also beginning to see what happens to the institutions that have been disrupted this way. Let me offer one last example. Science journalist Julia Belouz wrote an article last month about the problem with press coverage of medical journals. Um, working in the current system, she writes, we reporters feed on press releases from journals, and it's difficult to, re to resist the siren call of flashy findings. We are incentivized to find novel things to write about, just as scientists and research in institutions need to attract attention to their work. Patients, of course, want better medicines, better procedures, and hope. None of these things are wrong. Um, they're all positive, but this cycle of reporting early results before they've been tested encourages a faith in magic bullets and pseudoscientific pseudo miracle treatments. Belouz claims that chasing these flashy findings results in deeply flawed studies, siphoning time, resources, and research away from work that might actually benefit us. A recent study by The Lancet estimated that more than 85% of annual global spending on research is wasted on badly designed or redundant studies. And that's pretty disturbing. Um, in an ideal world, we would, we would be able both to get it right and to make it interesting. But at a time when public trust in institutions feels like it's at an all-time low, we should be concerned about how often we are called upon to choose between the two and about which of them seems to bring the most reward. For Burroughs, the symbiotic relationship between host and virus was an uneasy one, and it didn't leave the host unscathed. 
If I have a final note, it's that those of us interested in digital rhetorics are well positioned not only to understand, analyze, and critique viral events, we need to be capable of engaging and even shaping the structures, technologies, and cultural logics that generate them. It's a pretty tall order, but I think it's worth trying. Thanks. Memetics. Memetics. Okay, one more time. <laughs> uh, questions, Colin? Closing thoughts too. Oh, you got that right. Okay, so if virality is the frame by which we're creating content online, and it could have it can affect or undermine other more ethical or valuable goals of writing and creating. How can we adjust our approaches when we teach our students? We want to, especially if we're teaching them professional writing, we want to teach them skills that they'll use, but teaching them to write catchy titles and content is, from the frame you've presented, teaching potentially unethical writing. True. <laughs> I mean, there's no, there's no easy answer. And I mean, there's no, it goes back to, it also goes back to Lanham and the weak defense, strong defense of rhetoric. Um, you know, I, I can't give you a formula that prevents that work from potentially being unethical. Um, the same forces that do things that we like do things that we hate. Um, I think that some positive changes in this country have happened because of viral content. But then I can also give you just as many sort of dismal things that have happened as a result. Um, and I mean, I, I kind of sort of dance around it obliquely. But the fact is, is that there are plenty of sort of viral events where specific people are targeted um, or doxxed or, you know, have their lives ruined as a result. Um, and there's no way to prevent that from happening beforehand. Um, but I do think that we're not always... I mean, the, the Pew report that talked about how 40% of people don't realize that um, Facebook has an algorithm that sorts their feed for them. Um, we're not always aware of the algorithms and the effects. You know, I mean, we may think that conversations are kind of over because they've disappeared from view um, when they're not. What Kim argues is that the speed with which Twitter processes these kinds of stories mitigates against kind of communal collective action. And that's one of the things that she's pretty critical of. Sure. Other questions? Yeah. Thanks, Colin. Great talk. Thanks. Um, and thank you to all the speakers and all the um, people who put this conference together. Um, I guess since we're sort of at the end here and asking questions, I saw a lot of people on Twitter asking, you brought up a lot of good ethical quandaries and conundrums, uh, Colin. I was wondering if you could talk about what an ethics of social media in terms of digital rhetoric would look like. I know it's a big question. Um, there would be yeah. like four collected books written on this yeah. from us. But if you could just talk extemporaneously and tell us your thoughts about what that might look like. Uh, gosh, that's a, that's one of those questions I want to think about for about 10 or 15 minutes before I answer. Um, I think that some of the, I mean, I think understanding, engaging with, these sort of deeper cultural media logics, understanding how um, the networks and the technologies and the algorithms affect us and how we can affect them um, and sort of interact with them. I mean, I, I don't know that there's necessarily an automatic kind of ethics implied there, but I guess I feel like um, it's one of our most important tasks right now 
not because a lot of these things are proprietary. Um, and we're seeing with the Facebook experiment, with the whole um, the OKCupid okay experiment, where these where companies are feeling comfortable manipulating us through their algorithms because we don't know how they operate in the first place. Um, so I mean, I, I guess awareness is definitely the, sort of the first step in that. I think too that there is. In his response to, uh, so the owner of OKCupid was, he's the, the fellow who published the book Dataclism. And in his review of his book, Evan Selinger talks about like thinking about our data in terms of structural integrity. Um, not structural integrity, it's, um, oh gosh, I'm gonna raise the issue and not remember the, ac the actual term. Um, but just he talks about how there's sort of this notion that our personal data is frictionless and can be taken from one context, contextual integrity. They can be taken from one context and put to use in other contexts, um, sometimes with our permission, sometimes without our permission, but that that sort of movement of data is frictionless. Um, and so one of the things I've thought about is whether or not we need to actually think about sort of um, friction as a value to embrace. Um, so, I mean, those are a couple of like half-hearted answers. Further, further questions? Yeah, Dave. Hey, Colin, uh, great talk. And it got me thinking again, I find myself um, adding another node to a, a kind of network conversation here Casey's introduction of transductive, uh, you know, kind of transduction, um, Thomas's notion of outrage, Jeff's outrageousity, and now this this concern with virility, or yeah, and um, it, it just seems like I'm wondering if it's a bit of a kind of historic moment right now where you have these networks that, as Bill. Um, describes them in a tweet, which I, I realize you don't have access to, are kind of scale-free in terms of their power law distribution. In other words, they're kind of friction-free, you know? Whether this kind of viralness or outrageousness is going to come to an end as certain media change, or is this really, and I also appreciate what Jeff was saying about how it's really not in the network per se, it's cultural, but Again, like gossip may be viral, but there are plenty of dispositions within an individual or a culture in which that wouldn't go viral. So yeah, it's kind of a big open-ended thing. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I mean, my the the book that I'm working on may make the argument that we are in fact at kind of this historical moment. Um, I think that there's a. I'm I'm really always hesitant to say, oh, we're in the middle of an epistemic shift or a paradigm shift or blah, blah, blah. But I do think it's a relatively new circumstance and that certain kind of sets of values are coming into conflict with one another. And it's hard to know exactly what's happening and what to do about it. Um, I don't think, I, I certainly don't have all the answers. Um, I think we're still, we're struggling to sort of figure out what to do. Um, more so now than say even just like five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, you know, and I mean, I was, yeah, I'm, I have open-ended answer to your open-ended question. Yeah, da, da, da. Um, but I do think it's actually, I, it, you can see, I can see, I think there are like lots of threads that trace back to other stuff, like the memetic stuff, I think had an effect. And so I, I don't think it's like an absolute break with everything that came before. But I think that all of those forces kind of are tangled up and sort of arriving at, a, at this moment and doing some things that we weren't necessarily prepared for them to do. Um, yeah, sir. Finally get a question in at the very end. Sure. This is more of a comment, Colin, and to everybody. I teach with a lot of viral content, everything. That was up there I put in you know pretty much all of my classes because I think it's important for students to be exposed to this and be exposed to um, the content that's going viral and to do both analysis like Colin did showing us so oh, the photographer was a professional photographer 
expose that, but then also, yeah, teach them to participate too. Because what is critique going to do? How far is that going to get us? I don't think it's going to stop. It might change medium, but it's not all of a sudden going away. Yeah, so absolutely. I do a lot. I think it's important for us in digital rhetoric to make that part of our project. Let's look at him, this meme and trace its, um, you know, how it went viral and who was the tastemaker and why and so on. And then critique that. But then also, how would you participate in this and how would you participate in it maybe a little more thoughtfully than some of the other examples? So that's just kind of a comment. I don't know if you have anything to say about that, Colin. But. Um, I agree 100%. I mean, I, I think it's, um, you can't decide ahead of time that it's bad. I mean, I, but I think that there are situations where it does bad things. There are situations where it does great things. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's not something that we're going to be able to, we can't just turn it off. We can't just say, oh, we're just going to stop using Twitter. I'm going to shut Twitter down. I mean, that just isn't realistic. And so, um, but I mean, and that's what, you know, what, Roland Barthes says in mythologies that it, you have to be able to sort of appreciate the myths as well as resist them. And you have to be able to kind of toggle back and forth between that. Um, you know, it's not enough just to say they're bad or they're good, um, but to be able to sort of occupy both. So, yeah. All right, so we have a question from uh, Jessica Shoemake, who would like you to talk about ethical algorithms versus proprietary logics and how uh, what you present today might help us uh, think through building uh, collective communal action networks. Um. Gosh, that's another question that I want to think about for 10 or 15 minutes before I answer. Um, I think that part of the part of the one of the paths to sort of like moving away from the proprietary logics is to do I mean, uh, to do things like what Yoon Song Kim is doing and to actually like collect the data and look at what it does um, to watch a site for a month and to track, you know, the what appears in the trends, uh, how often the hashtags are using. And there's a, I mean, we, we can't simply accept the logics of those. Um, I don't know that... question of ethical algorithms is a question that I want to like make three or four of you come stand up here next to me to answer <laughs> first, right? Um, I mean, I th it's a, the, the sort of promotional, the promotional line on a lot of social media is it tries to make itself invisible to us and imagines we are encouraged to imagine that it's kind of this unmediated connective space. And the fact is, is that it shapes our experiences of each other in ways that I don't think we're always aware of. Um, I don't know if it's possible to sort of build spaces counter to those, but certainly the first step in um, shaping as, you know, at the same time that we're being shaped is to sort of make ourselves aware of, I mean, to me, that's the sort of the route to kind of the collective communal stuff that Kim is talking about. That's not, that wasn't a great answer. Sorry. Sorry, Twitter. <laughs> uh, Kathy Yancey had a question. Sure. Thanks. Uh, my thanks as well, Collins. Great talk. Very provocative. Um, so, it strikes me that one of the things that you've done here is to um, plot or define what we might consider to be a perfect storm that brings um, all the things one needs together to make happen what you've just depicted. So the cult cultural conditions, the ideologies, the technologies, and so forth. I'm wondering about the utility of 
doing a kind of comparative study of other countries in particular where um, the perfect conditions might not obtain yeah. and or we might um, develop a model of a different kind of perfect storm that would foster the kind of behavior and rhetoric uh, that we prefer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very conscious of this being sort of a U.S. centric kind of a thing that I'm describing here. And I mean, yeah, yes to both of your sort of possibilities. I'm, it, it, one of the, the things that your question sort of reminds me of is that article by the social media editor for the TED Talks. She wrote that piece about um, what happened right after they posted the Monica Lewinsky talk about shame culture. And she sort of does this kind of analysis of the steps that they had to go through in order to get to the point where the comments were like, weren't, weren't toxic. Um, and those kinds of sort of analyses and discussions. And honestly, those kinds of commitments to that kind of discourse, I think are positive. Um, yeah, I mean, looking at one of the things that maybe is another sort of factor that I don't get to here is just sort of the diffusion of technology and the fact that we went through a particular series of steps that included things like television and extreme sort of media centralization that people in other countries may not experience nearly as acutely as we do. Um, and so they may not have the same kind of motive for the sort of democratization, decentralization that we have in embracing social media. So I, I mean, both of those points, I think, are dead on. Sure. Thomas Rickard has Thomas a question. Thomas Rickard has a question. Uh, hi, Colin. Hey. Great talk. Thank you. Really liked it. Thanks. Um, I have an odd question, or what seems odd, but there's, there's a logic behind it. OK. I have a cryptic answer. <laughs> Excellent. Um, how do how do virility and popularity both resonate and 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 become dissonant with each other? Because they do. And yet, popularity we tend to think of more positively, and virility more negatively. And I'm interested in that difference. Um, my first sort of gut reaction to that is that when the whole dress thing went crazy, what was happening was like at first people were like really engaged in whether it was white and gold or blue and black. And then people were like criticizing the people who were still posting about that stuff. And then like the mainstream media made themselves kind of try and look cool by referencing it three or four days after the fact. And then there were think pieces written about how we were trying to police their attention by telling them not to talk about it. I mean, it, so that there was this whole sort of, to me, that sort of popularity cycle while virality was going, like it, all of those things, all of those different responses are included and sort of captured by virality, I think. Um, so maybe that's one of the places where I would distinguish. That wasn't a very cryptic answer though, um, ghosts. <laughs> any any more questions for Colin? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, let's thank him.